The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus said to the crowds, This is how it is, it is with the kingdom of God. It is as if a man were to scatter seed on the land and would sleep and rise night and day. And through it all, the seed would sprout and grow. He knows not how. Of its own accord, the land yields fruit. First the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe, it wields the sickle at once, for the harvest has come. He said, to what shall we compare the kingdom of God? Or what, par what parable can we use for it? It is like a mustard seed, that when it's, it is sown in the ground, it is the smallest of all the seeds on the earth. But once it is sown, it springs up and becomes the largest of plants puts forth large branches so that the birds of the sky can dwell in its shade with many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to understand it without parables he did not speak to them but to his own disciples he explained everything in private the gospel of the Lord Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Lord is good here in this gospel, especially for us country people. <laughs> this perfect analogy, what is it, look what he says here. And we all understand it because we all guard in some way. He says that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. You ever seen a mustard seed, by the way? Tiny, tiny little thing. Tiny, almost microscopic. <laughs> it's a tiny thing. He says, the kingdom of God is like that. And, instead, and then, over time, as we all know, as gardeners, will begin to flourish. But what do we all know about seeds and planting? You can't just plant a seed in your garden and hope that it'll just take care of itself and, and, and produce amazing fruit. No. What do we have to do? We have to cultivate the soil. Watch over it, water it, pull out the weeds, and some of you weirdos even sing to your plants, right? <laughs> what do we have to do? You have to hover around it. You gotta, you gotta baby the plants. You can't, a bad gardener will just plant it like, oh, where are my tomatoes? No, you gotta watch over it. And so Jesus says the kingdom of God, the life of God within every single one of us is like that seed. When you and I were baptized, that was the mustard seed. That was the mustard seed right there planted in you. And when you received confirmation, that was the soil, that was the water poured into you. Use that analogy now. If my faith is a mustard seed then in me, I must cultivate the seed of faith. Otherwise, what happens to the seed if we don't water, we don't, we don't pull out the weeds, we don't sing to it? What happens to the seed? It will choke and die. Oh, my brothers and sisters, our faith can choke and die. Just by neglecting it. It's easy to do. What is, what limits us from truly flourishing in our faith? Because notice now, notice the analogy of our Lord that he uses. He says this mustard seed is designed and it is meant to flourish in our lives. So much so, he even lays it out. He says, it springs up and becomes the largest of plants and puts forth large branches that the birds of the sky can dwell in the shade. Do you know how massive that thing is supposed to be? That's the spiritual life. That's the Christian set on fire. That is the Christian dramatically in love with the Lord. We're not meant to be mediocre Christians. Nah. 
Christianity is, like how to crack Christianity is boring. Produces no fruit. We're meant for more. And one of the biggest hindrances in our lives, what stops us from truly flourishing, one of the weeds which stifles us is our brokenness. You see, my friends, let's all be honest here. Let's, let's let our hair down. Let's, let's be real. Every single one of us is broken. We all have pain in our lives. We all have trauma. We all have wounds. Every single one of us do. Don't pretend. We all keep masks up to, to say, look, look, look how beautiful I am. We all do that. <sighs> We're walking wounded. And how I know this is that it all manifests itself. How, what it looks like, what these weeds look like in our day-to-day -day lives. Think of all the addictions we have. I call this approach with the weeds now to help us kind of keep on track and it's a pithy little formula. I call it the three Ps with this pain we have. We all do either of these three or a mix of the three. The first P is that we protect it. We protect the pain through these addictions. The alcoholism. What is that? What is that? What is alcohol? It's rampant in our society, rampant in our own families. What is it? It is when I have so much pain in my life that I drink myself to the point where, guess what? My problems go away for a few hours, at least. It goes away. I don't think about the pain anymore. Many, many of us take that route. Drug abuse. Oh, drug abuse. You know how cancerous that is in our society and even our own county, our own town. What is that? It's an attempt to escape, isn't it? It also manifests itself in addictions of eating. Oh, this is my favorite way, by the way, protecting my own pain. Oh, fried chicken. I got fried chicken, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What is that? It's an attempt where we eat our pain away. Because it's like alcoholism. When we have that fried chicken, whatever your food of choice is, ah, it goes away for a while. Another addiction that we have, buying stuff. Right, we have this pain, so what do we do? Oh, I got to buy it. I got to buy this. I got to get the latest this or that. Because what does that do? It fills some sense of void in us. We buy something new, but what happens? We all know this. That buzz wears off, so I got to get the new one next. It's relentless, isn't it? Constantly, constantly trying to, trying to keep up to date with the Joneses, as we say. What is that? It's the protection of the wound, whatever it is. The first P of protection is basically we sweep it under the rug, we ignore it, and we hope it just goes away. But guess what? That wound is there. We protect the pain. The second letter, P. We project the pain. Because I am broken, I am wounded, I hurt the other people around me. And who absorbs the brunt of that? Our loved ones. Because I am broken inside, I am frustrated and angry and I'm envious, then I hurt you. And a perfect example of this, bullying. We all know bullying is bad. And we try to stamp it out, especially in our schools. What is the bully? And we all know this. Why does the bully hurt other people, especially the weakest among us? Because as we all know, for all their strength and, the, and all their anger, they are the most broken inside. And so what the, must they do with that pain that they have? I must hurt the other in order to make me feel better. I project this pain onto other people. Alcoholics Anonymous has a beautiful saying. Hurt people hurt people, my brokenness and my pain, and I lash out at you. And if you're in my home, you feel it first. We protect the pain, we project the pain, and now comes the third option, which is the way of Jesus Christ. 
The third P is that we must purify the pain. What do I mean by that? This is the person who recognizes that they are broken and says that I am a mess. And we let in the light. We bring it out. We no longer hide from it. This, my friends, is the person who brings their pain, especially as Catholics, the sacrament of confession. See, this is why I love the confessional. Especially now, especially as priests, when I go to confession, these are my friends. We hang out, we go to dinner, we go to the movies together. We, and so we all know each other. And I always, whenever I go to confession to a brother priest, I want to go to him face to face. Because I don't want to hide my pain and my woundedness. I want him to look at me as I share with him my deepest, darkest, and most shameful actions. And I want, to, I want to feel that sting. I want to feel the salt on that wound. <laughs> because as we all know, what does salt do? What does this thing mean? It's being purified. I don't want to hide from it. This is the Christian who purifies the pain. Is a, a person who prays. Humbly. Especially in the power of silence. The great French philosopher Blaise Pascal <laughs> famously said, that all human problems stems from the fact that man cannot sit quietly in a room by himself. That's perceptive. All of man's problems stem from the fact that he can't sit alone quietly in a room by himself. Because why, why is that? Notice that. Try, especially as modern people, try sitting in a room for 15 minutes in silence. No distractions, nothing else. Just sit there and quiet. What happens is, is that all of a sudden now, there's no more hiding. You're faced with the reality and the truth of yourself. See, this is why we always, we always hide from ourselves. We always distract ourselves. Social media, video games, relentlessly numbing ourselves. Because we're trying, to sense, we're trying to run away from ourselves. And when you sit in silence, all of that comes to the fore. <laughs> and we want to hide from it. But it must be purified. Our Lord himself, if you recall, I preached this a couple months ago. When Jesus with his disciples prophesied that he would eventually die, he laid out that I will be killed. He links himself to Moses. At first, it sounded strange. He says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so must I, the son of man, be lifted up. What happened to Moses in the desert? He's referring to Deuteronomy chapter, or rather, Numbers 21, verse 9. If you remember that time period, the Israelite people are in the desert. They're journeying towards the promised land. They're journeying there and... What happens? They begin to complain because God is too slow. We all know that God, God's like a turtle, remember? God just moves like a turtle. He's just kind of cruising along like, God, hurry up, move, act, do something. He's too slow. And so because God was so slow, there's a lot of people began to complain in the desert. And so they began to complain to Moses. And so in punishment, God sends them, remember that incident? He sends them serpents to them which bites them and kills many of them to the point where they begin to repent. Oh no, we've complained, we've offended God. And so they go to Moses, 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 we're so sorry for complaining to God. Help, help, help. And then Moses brings their pleas to the Lord and God says, all right, Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent. Mounted on a pole, lift it up. And all of Israel, whoever gazes upon the serpent, will be healed. So what does that mean then? The serpent is the cause of their shame, their suffering, and their pain. So what Moses did there, he showed them their deepest, darkest secrets, which we all hide. He says, no, look at it. Be purified of it. Let me use it. And so that incident in Numbers 21, Jesus directly refers to it. He says, now... 
I will be lifted up on the cross, just as Moses lifted up the serpent. And all of a sudden, it makes complete sense now when you link the two. Because remember, what is the cross? Why is the full, bloody, battered Jesus on the cross? My friends, that's all of our pain and our suffering. There up there is, a, is rejection of love, which is the cause of many of our pain, by the way. Rejection of love. It is shame. Our Lord was naked on there. How many of our addictions use promiscuity? That's another popular addiction. An attempt to soothe this, this, this pain of intimacy, which we long for, and it, and it plays itself out in the hookup culture on college campuses. Oh, rampant. That's up there on the cross. A Lord betrayed by those who loved him the most. Ah, right there. Mockery, anger, envy. All of our pain and our suffering is on the cross right there. And so what Jesus says now in the, in the beautiful act of his crucifixion, he says to, to humanity, look upon your shame. Look upon it. Don't hide from it. Because we all have a tendency, it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve. Remember when they first sinned in the Garden of Eden? When they, when they ate from the fruit of the, of the forbidden tree, what does Adam and, do? Adam and Eve do? He said that God is walking through the garden, and it said they hid from God. Adam, where are you? God called out. And they hid behind the bush. We all do that with our shame, which is why as you go to confession, it's like pulling teeth. Because we're hiding in the bush. Don't look at me, Father. <laughs> I'm shameful. Oh, we're all wounded. And God wants us to deal with our pain and our suffering. To pull out the weeds from the root. Don't protect it through our addictions. Don't project it by hurting those you love the most. Purify it. You see, once we reach this stage, and this will, this will only happen in, in Jesus Christ, is when we gaze upon it. What is the breakthrough? For, for many of us who have been involved in Alcoholics Anonymous, what happens? What is that pivotal breakthrough? When they're all, and we all know this well, especially if you watch movies. When they sit around in that, in that circle, sitting around, huh? As they're, as in their small groups. The pivotal breakthrough was when that new person comes in there, and all of a sudden, for whatever reason, he stands up. And he says those famous lines. My name is Brian. And I am an alcoholic. What did he just do there? He brought out his shame to the entire group. He has taken responsibility for his, for his actions. And he says, I take responsibility for my pain and my suffering. And I bear it out before you. It is only then when the person can be healed because no longer, they're not running anymore. This is when, my friends, the roots are pulled out and we can finally begin to flourish. And you and I, and I guarantee you, when we do this, when we purify our pain and our shame, we'll become like this plant, the mustard seed. You know, once sown, it springs up and becomes the largest of plants, puts forth large branches, the birds of the sky can dwell in the shade. Freedom. Freedom. And our sins no longer have any power over us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit.